This is John Crook interviewing Seni Senevaratni for New Cultural Voices or History Project in Sheffield on Tuesday, 12th of February 2013. Seni, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your family background? Yes, I was born in Leeds in the 1950s and my mother was from Yorkshire, um, born and bred in Yorkshire, and my father was from Sri Lanka, which was then known as Ceylon. Um, he'd been in Leeds since he was a boy. He'd been at school there, and um, my mother and father had met um, through the Catholic Church, in fact. Um, and um, yeah, I was one of four children, um, and well, for a long time I was the youngest of three, and uh, then my younger sister came along nine years later. We grew up in um, in a Leeds that was. Um, there were very few uh, black families really that I kind of knew or were around mm -hmm. in the area that I lived in um, and it was very unusual to have a mixed race family really um, and uh, my mother used to tell stories about um, when my brother who was the eldest was when she was pregnant with him that um, you know she'd overheard people saying well I wonder what it'll be like I wonder what it'll you know what she'll have, kind of thing. What what will it be like? And uh, this friend of hers who'd overheard it had said, "Well, he'll have ten fingers and ten toes. What do you think?" You know. So it was, there were those kind of stories that used to go around. And and my grandmother used to tell stories. Actually, my mum's mum about how people used to come knocking on her door. One day, somebody came and knocked on her door and said, "I've just seen your daughter in town with a black man." And she said, "Yes, I know. He's he's." sitting in my room now having a cup of tea and um, so m my my sense was that my mum's family were were it wasn't a problem for them at all mm -hmm. um, yeah. and uh, you know they just kind of dealt with it really they just dealt with uh, what would have been probably um, you know people's um, what would you say kind of disapproval maybe or prejudice prejudice really yeah um, and I think that my mother must have been an incredibly brave woman. They were married, I mean, they were together before my dad. My dad fought in the British Army, so they were, I think they must have got engaged before he went to the war, and they got married in 1946 when he came back. And I think my mum must have been quite a kind of brave, feisty young woman, really, to, um, to think, well, that's what I'm going to do, um, mm. and I don't care what people say. Um, so she was quite rebellious in that way, really. Um, I think I get some of my rebellious spirit from her, although she didn't enjoy my rebe rebellious <laughs> spirit very much. Um, so yeah, I grew up um, in a mixed race family, and um, we the family was it was mainly the extended family was my mum's family, uh, kind of Yorkshire working class family, a lot of uh, love and loyalty and good wholesome food and that kind of thing um, and um, I didn't really see very much of my dad's family. My, my dad's mum had died when he was very young and his father um, had married again and was living in back in Ceylon um, and uh, I only saw him probably once actually in my life when I was about five years old. Um, so. It was a kind of, um, I lived and grew up in Yorkshire and Ceylon was this place that was in picture books really. Um, it was a place that, my dad didn't talk a, a lot about it, um, but they, my grandfather's second wife used to send these magazines that had all these pictures of Ceylon in them. And I, I can remember f looking at these books and feeling it as this like really magical place and um, so it was a bit of a sort of dream place in a way um, and then there was real life in Yorkshire. I think they were, um, I think it was the Catholic, I think it was the religion actually, you know for them it was like this boy is a Catholic, um, you know he's gone to a good Catholic school, he's grown up with all of us, he's been part of you know the the kind of group of young people that have all been around together so he's just one of us in a way that was how they I think that was how they saw it 
And I think in my fa it goes even further back in my family because actually my grandfather, his second wife that he married in 1928 was a young Yorkshire woman. Um, and uh, her parents, again, this kind of working class family from Leeds, um, I'm amazed that they kind of, because she married my grandfather and went back to Salon with him and um, her, her father must have been an incredibly free thinker really to just <laughs> sort of say, yeah, fine, yeah. Um, so this connection between Yorkshire and Salon goes right back to the 1920s really um, and uh, there's been all this kind of intermarriage if you like. Um, my you know, my dad, I think my grandfather thought my dad would go back to Salon and he was kind of probably hoping he would marry, a, uh, you know, somebody from there and kind of live there. But my dad had already met my mum by then. And then my uncle, who was from his second marriage, he also came over to England to go to college and then he met a woman from Yorkshire and he married her. So there's been this kind of, this kind of uh, interrelationship between Ceylon, Sri Lanka and Yorkshire for mm -hmm. many, many years really. Um, which I, I feel is a very, it's a very rich heritage that I have. Um, I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like it's ever, it hasn't really ever felt to me like a disadvantage at all mm. to have that, really. Um, I think the, well, the biggest thing about me being, uh, particularly being a writer, being a poet, um, I'm not sure where it comes from. It's it's interesting that my grandfather, my father's father, was himself a poet. And I do know, and I've come to appreciate more, the fact that my father really loved poetry, liked to recite poetry. Um, and so, and, in, and my father was very eloquent. I know that he kind of, he was quite involved in the Catholic Church and he gave lots of speeches at various events and things. So... He was a very good speech writer, very good at crosswords. So he had a very, he had a, a love of language. Um, and although my mother wasn't, um, she, she wasn't as kind of literate, literary or literate as my father, um, she'd had to leave school early uh, because, her, you know, she came from quite, not a very well off working class family and she'd had to stay at home to help her mum look after a sick relative. So um, she, um, I think she gave me something else really. In fact, what she gave me was my love of singing because she was a beautiful singer and I used to listen to her singing while she was doing the housework. And, um, and, and that's something else that I do now. So as mm. well as being a poet, I'm also a singer. So I think I got those two things from each of them. Well, they wanted us all to do well and they wanted us to have uh, advantages that they'd not had. Um, and because we grew up, um, well, we, we, we all came to a kind of university sort of age, at a time when uh, it didn't cost a lot of money to go to university. Um, you know, all of us, all four of us were able to go to university. And I often think now that if in the current situation, my father would never have been able to afford to do that. You know, he wasn't kind of incredibly well off. So um, that was a big advantage for us, really. So we, you know, he, he wanted us to take advantage of the education system and he wanted us to do well and get good jobs and do all of those kinds of things. And so the idea of me being a kind of an artist and not really having a career as such, um, didn't really wouldn't have appealed to him really um and i'm the only one out of all four of us who, who took that path really mm -hmm. all the others kind of got into something as a career that they pursued whereas i've always done work as a way of financing what i really want to do which is to it which is to be an artist of some kind mm -hmm. well i would say i mean one of the sad things is that the first um, the first publication that I had, uh, we, we, I did it with two or two other women in Sheffield, um, two other Asian women in Sheffield, and it came out in 1989. And my father had died in 1988, and so he never actually saw that. And I took it to my mum, 
she was really um, pleased and proud of it actually and it's quite interesting because it was a book of poems and photographs and some of the poems are a bit I mean they were it was a long time ago and some of the poems now I'd think oh my god they need editing whatever but um, you know they were there they were raw they were out on the page some of them were a bit edgy um, and uh, she kind of I remember her saying oh I showed this to the parish priest came around to visit us and I showed him it and I was really proud of it and I'm thinking oh okay, I wonder what he thought of it you know <laughs> so she was really really proud of it um, it didn't kind of seem to matter to her what the content was it mm. was the fact that I had I'd, I'd actually done it and I got it out there. There was one poem in there that was about my father's death. He died quite, he was only 70 when he died, he died of cancer and um, she asked me about it and um, yeah she was very kind of moved by it and everything and asked me why I'd never showed her it before and all of those sorts of things so yeah I think it was, um, I think she was proud of me actually, mm -hmm. yeah I think she was. I've always been very involved in, um, I've always been an activist and um, always wanted, had this big desire to change the world and to make the world a better place. Um, and um, for me, it just, it's inevitable that that becomes part of everything that I do, that becomes part of my writing as well. So, although I'm not, um, I, w I want to write about things, things happen and I want my writing to be a response. When I was growing up, my poetry was, um, was my way of dealing with the world or dealing with my, what was happening for me or things to do with my identity or this idea of not belonging, you know, never ever feeling like I belonged anywhere properly, mm. always never truly accepted anywhere. Um, even though I was born in Leeds, you know, I could be out and people would look at me as if I wasn't from there. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I guess for me, the extension of that is that something major happens in the, w in the world um, that, I, that has an impact on me and I want to bear witness to that in some way. Mm -hmm. But I don't want it to be a political speech. Um, I don't want it to be a polemic, I want it to be a, lyri a, a, a lyric, I want it to be a, a, poet, a piece of poetry kind of thing. So I want to have a poetic response to things that are very, um, people might think are not very poetic, things like conflict, trauma, war, I want to have a poetic response to it and I think it's an enormous challenge. Um, I used to read the war poets a lot when I was younger, uh, you know, that was my first sort of, and actually, a bit like my father copying out The Highwayman, I used to write out, handwrite out, um, uh, you know, Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen poems, and uh, you know, I've got, still got this book with all these mm. handwritten poems. So it is an interest that I've always had in trying to find a way of expressing horror through, through poetry and the reason I think it's important is because I think there's a long history of poets being, um, uh, well Shelley said poets are the le true legislators of the world, that they're the ones who try and change people's hearts um, rather than change people's minds or something mm -hmm. or as well as changing people's minds and um, so that's my motivation really, um, it comes it comes from inside me needing to do something, me needing to respond. And then the challenge is, how do I respond in a way that is not, um, that is poetic and is not over sentimental and is not cliched? How do I find a way of responding to, um, you know, the war in Iraq, for instance, uh, by, you know, through a poem um, and, and I try different ways of doing that and one of the ways I responded to um, one of the ways I responded to that in one of my in my latest book was by writing a poem in the voice of the mother of um, a returning US uh, soldier mm -hmm. um, who committed suicide and um, 
you know, it feels like that's a way of saying something um, that's important for people to hear, um, but a different way of saying it, really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of being from Yorkshire, particularly mm. when I'm not in Yorkshire. <laughs> um, it is important because of what I said before about um, this connection that there's been over over many years in my family mm. between Yorkshire and um, somewhere really far away from Yorkshire and very different to Yorkshire. Um, and something about the kind of um, something about this, the the you mentioned before about this these people who who seem to be very accepting of difference and of mm. people coming along and marrying their daughters you know people from halfway across the world coming along and getting married to their daughters and not seeming to have a there's something about a kind of down to earth approach to things somehow that seems to have been there in my family and I've always um, I've always kind of felt it's really important to value uh, I think there was a period of time uh, in the 70s maybe in the 80s when people were very people of mixed heritage there was this kind of sense that you had to deny the sort of side of your family that was white, of white heritage or something mm. and not be proud of it somehow and only claim your um, black roots if you like mm -hmm. and it's always been important to me to see the importance of everything about my family and the really positive things that I think I got from from that kind of Yorkshire working class roots that I mm grew up in and you know was around me and um, and those values that must have been there actually mm. in the family um, that I've kind of taken on and taken on board so yeah it is important to me but the other thing is that they were very um, traditional and mm -hmm. I'm not traditional at all so um, so there was, there's like a tension there mm -hmm. and I think um, the tension is what is what breeds creativity in a way because mm. if everything's all just running smoothly then there's there's no pull really to to, to have mm. um to do something different so it is that sort of tension between this very kind of close loving family that i also felt the need to get away from to be myself and to grow in the way that i needed to so you know I went away from Yorkshire to Essex University because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go to one of the new universities. I didn't want to go to anything that anybody approved of. Um, I didn't want to go, um, you know, to one of the kind of uh, traditional universities. Um, and I did it out of a sense of, well, I want to do something different. And I, and I, and I studied sociology because I wanted to do something different, even sure. though I'd done English, Latin and French A-levels and mm -hmm. you would have thought I might have gone into something more um, kind of kind of arts, on an art, in the arts kind of side really. Um, so I did lots of things that were about breaking out of that, um, which I had to do um, in order to make sense of who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and then to sort of piece things back. It was almost like breaking out, throwing everything aside and then saying, okay, now what do I want? What makes sense for me? What are my values? Yes, I am spiritual, but I don't want to be a Catholic anymore. Um, I don't believe in all of that. Uh, I need to remake it, kind of recreate it that make, in a way that makes sense for me. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I have it's a, it's a, it's quite late on that I've discovered um, that I've got all these other creative uh, kind of things about me that mm -hmm. I've never expressed. Yeah. So I go back, I go back to my childhood, and I think when I was at school, I used to go to art classes and the. 
and the teacher would say, uh, okay, do a painting of this. And I'd sit there and I couldn't think of anything and I couldn't think what to do and I, and I was like, get totally stressed about it and, um, and then end up not doing anything. Uh, and uh, I thought I was no good at art. So when it came to making my choices about subjects, I did biology instead of art because that was the choice you were given. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I can do, I'll be able to do biology. And now I realise is that that was because they weren't really helping us to play. You know, they weren't helping us to like play with the materials and be creative with them. They were just telling you to do something on a blank piece of paper mm. and uh, you know when I do writing workshops now you know the big thing that I always stress is that it's not about having a blank piece of paper now you must write something it's about learning how to play with words and mm. I think what I'm now having this benefit of doing is um, being in different situations where I'm learning how to play with other materials besides language really because I've always done that with language but mm. Now being able to get a big lump of clay and play with that, or um, some paints and play with them, is just you know it's just great. Um, yeah, so it 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 kind of makes me feel a bit sad about that little girl who could have probably benefited a lot from mm. doing all those things. Um, you know, because because I, I was quite when I was you won't probably wouldn't believe it but I was very very shy when I was a child and um, yeah it took me a long time to sort of work through all of that and I just think if I'd have had some of that those different ways of expressing myself maybe you know maybe it would have been a bit of an easier ride I guess um, but anyway I've got there now so. Sammy thanks very much. Okay thank you.